Uh, uh, probably. All right. Fine. Hey, we are back. We are fortunate enough to have the former senator, uh, Link Chafee, here. He has uh, been a, a Republican, a Democrat, and he's now joined the LP. Welcome. Thank you. I also was an independent. So <laughs> I got finally the, found a party, uh, an anti-war party, I'm, anti-deficit I'm, party. I'm, I'm looking for the, uh, the cliche, batting for the cycle in baseball is what they say. Um, how do you feel about your, your whole first experience? Is this your first debate within the LP? Yes, it is. Yeah, and how are you feeling about it? I enjoyed being up there with the other eight uh, yeah. candidates, and the uh, moderator was good. We had good questions and good uh, dialogue. Uh, it's great to be part of this process. How, how, what's the what's the feeling in in the environment here in terms of just being different from the other uh, the other parties you've been part of? Well, there's a passion here with libertarians that uh, is unique from yeah. the other parties, and uh, a belief in kind of an underdog belief in the values that they stand for, we stand for, and uh, it's fun. All right. Um, I, first question that, that I have, um, it, it seemed like there was a, a bit of a sticking point on, on drugs, uh, in, in the war on drugs. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about what do you think, and, and I, I asked this question up front just because I saw there was a little bit of a sticking point up there. Um, what is the federal government's role in the war on drugs? Well, I've been consistent on this. In uh, my time in the Senate, I served in the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, and so I traveled through South America and Central America, and I saw firsthand uh, the decay that the drugs, our war on drugs, and the effect that the uh, under, underground drug trade has on these countries in the, our Western Hemisphere. And they, they corrupt the courts, they corrupt, corrupt law enforcement, they corrupt the banks. It, it's just so corrosive. Yeah. And, and we're part of it, our government, with our policies of trying to uh, intercept it, uh, eradicate it. Uh, we have paid for our taxpayer dollars substitution uh, for farmers that are growing cocoa. We, we pay them to, we, American taxpayers, to grow something else. It just doesn't work. It hasn't worked yeah. for decades now. So I've been consistent on be, opposing America's role in, so, in the war on drugs. And constitutionality, I heard, I heard you talk about that. Constitutionally, um, would you agree with the, the statement that the, the, the delegated powers to Congress do not allow for Congress to ban anything? Yes, and uh, the federal government now has different schedules of drugs, and it's so out of whack of what is reality. And we had a good discussion here in the debate also about our involvement overseas in these endless wars, and cre- these endless wars are creating a whole new generation of veterans, and it's the veterans that are lo- leading the way on having the government look differently uh, on what they have access, particularly on plant medicines as they come back dealing with post-traumatic stress and other issues. Uh, it's the veterans leading the way saying, we need to change uh, the federal government's uh, position, which I'm in favor of. I, I support the veterans on that. Okay. I appreciate your, your candor, Lincoln. Um, you got some tough questions during the debate about why, why you switched, and there's definitely some skepticism you can, you can feel from our side. Um, I'm wondering what your colleagues, former colleagues in the Senate, and just the people who, who knew you as a Republican and then an independent and, 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 and then a Democrat, have been saying their, their, their reaction to you becoming a libertarian. Well, first of all, I uh, expect to have some skepticism being so new to the party, and here I am on a presidential stage, and th- 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 I welcome that, that there should be hard questions uh, about my uh, association with the Libertarian Party, so I, I welcome those types of questions. And what would my colleagues say? I think they'd say that Chafee's being consistent. Uh, they links, uh, he's being consistent. We know him as someone that was always willing to rock the boat. As a Republican, I voted against the war. I voted against many of Bush's program, President Bush's programs. I didn't trust him, even though I was a Republican at the time. So my colleagues, they came to respect me in the Senate. Uh, I would get up in our caucus and defend my votes. And oftentimes it was me by myself uh, uh, on different issues. Uh, but I, I think my colleagues respect that, that I am consistent. As so, I said, I'm a, I'm a block of granite I, I don't, I, on, on certain issues. I, I just will not change on, on cer- certain things that I believe in. So since you have changed on some things like, like, like parties, what is the last big um, ideological switch you, you made? Some, some idea you, you previously held, and because of new information or new experiences, you, you, you decided that it was, uh, 
it, it was no longer that, that, that way and it changed something else. Well, I've learned a lot about uh, the positions on the Second Amendment in particular. That one, uh, as, uh, as the people of America have come to distrust their government, it, 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 that does resonate with me. And when people say, read the Second Amendment, read it, read every word of it. And I read the First Amendment, I read the Fourth Amendment. And I do believe now that the authors of the Constitution wrote those words for a time when the people don't trust their government. And legitimately, they shouldn't trust their government. There's so many lies being told to we us. definitely agree we, on that. And Snowden pointed it out. The Afghanistan papers just came out pointing out all the lies are being told about Afghanistan. Of course, the biggest one in American history, the no weapons of mass destruction. So there's a legitimate distrust of government, and that's why uh, these rights uh, were enshrined in the Bill of Rights. So um, there are, I'm, I'm glad you talked about uh, sex segment uh, laws and so forth. Um, do you, would, would you categorize all federal gun laws as unconstitutional and that they should be repealed? Or, is there, or are there some exceptions that, that, that you might find? I'm, I'm evolving uh, on that. I mean, do, do the people have a right to uh, a tank? Or uh, where, where d does that go? Uh, so, but certainly I'm more respectful than... Uh, in, in my, earlier in my career based on the growing and the, the times are changing growing distrust of government legitimately so, so every all these oh, candidates of so Barack Obama ran promising to close Guantanamo no drone strikes getting out of Iraq it didn't happen President Trump did oh, the it's same. terrible yeah so the people have a right to distrust the government yeah. that's why uh, these uh, words of the Bill of Rights were written, in my view. Yeah, I mean, it's easy enough when you go back to the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists who debated and you see in their writings in plain English. Well, maybe not as plain as it could be to, to modern man, but for those people that obviously have studied the, the timepiece, um, when you're not probably far enough down the road of libertarianism than to say that the ATF should probably be a convenience store. I'm, I will say that the NSA, National Security Agency, should be phased out. Sure. Uh, uh, so, yeah, and, and I, I, would love, I would love to hear, in terms of the federal government and, and, and constitutionality, Article 1, Section 8, obviously, um, the, the very defined and delegated constitutional powers. What, can you just rattle off a whole bunch of bureaucracy that should absolutely exist at the state and not the federal level? That's a giant task, and I, I think it's I mean, one just high level we ones. should we should do it. It's a task we should do as we look at the twenty-three trillion dollar deficit. And I would promise to eliminate that deficit. And so, how are we going to do it? It's looking at every department and uh, and taking department the tenth amendment and saying it doesn't. Department of Education. Yeah, the, yeah, you have to state. ask that state. That state. Uh, and it historically has been. Well, historically, I was a mayor, it was a family, we paid right? For the, yeah, as a mayor we, in our city, we paid for our local public schools. Well, and, and the state pays for our state colleges. Yeah. Why is federal government involved? Yeah. And all these no child left behind, all these federal programs, it, it, it's unconstitutional. Yeah, in my se view. 70 plus billion dollars a year is, is what we put at it in, in our education, obviously. I call it government indoctrination. It's, it's failing. Our, our, our next generation has failed a lot of generations. Um, I think when people kind of rebuff the indoctrination and they start to see what real liberty is and the, and the concept of what it is and they apply it in real life and, and, and definitely in governance, it, it has an amazing effect to, to raise the human condition. And you said $70 billion. $70 billion a year. Yeah, so there you go. Now we're chipping away at that $23 oh, yeah. trillion. Yeah. $70 billion yeah. adds yeah. up yes. pretty quick, doesn't yes. it? Um, I think uh, I want to be very respectful of your time, and I know you, you've got some things uh, to, to go through. Um, besides the Department of Education, um, we've talked about drugs. Uh, you, you were very adamant about foreign policy. I think that's probably one of the biggest sticking points here. In terms of what does America owe the rest of the world in terms of foreign policy? By virtue of our status of uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union and, and the changes that took place around the world, we, we emerged as a sole superpower at, that, at the turn of this century. And economically, militarily, culturally, everybody looked to us for leadership. And uh, I, I, my view is in the last 20 years, we have squandered that responsibility to lead the world responsibly. It's, now it's time for others to lead unless yeah. we change. And others are doing it, and maybe, and sometimes not to the best of our f children's future. So that's why I'm involved uh, to get back to the uh, 
the era when America could be trusted and uh, was respected for the decisions they made. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were honest. They, they didn't lie to the people and to the world. So we, so we pull everybody out. I mean, we're in 100, we have, we're, we're in 134, 133 countries. We, I, I think we have about 2,000 military bases around the world. Do we bring them all back? Certainly we move in that direction, and if we work towards uh, diplomatic solutions to the challenges around the world and uh, what's happening in Iran, don't forget it was just a few years ago, give Obama credit on this one, they put together the, nu- the nuclear deal with Iran, and at the table were the Iranians, the Americans, sure. the Germans, the French, the, uh, the Brits, the Russians, yeah, and we the did, Chinese, we, we, they were all there at the table. That's the way to solve well, it. It's not it, by it, killing some general. Yeah, and we, we unfroze assets that belong to the Shah. And so it was a different different type of thing that most people don't understand the history on to begin with, especially back to Operation Ajax and the CIA and all that fun stuff. In 1953. Yeah, there was yeah. A, another big, one of the biggest mistakes Absolutely. in American history. So, so to make it a little bit simpler to, to understand your foreign policy, let's say that things are in a better solution. We're, we're not engaged in, you could say, five, six, seven wars in, 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 in different countries. Do you think there is a just and moral and morally justified way to go to war and if so what does that look like of course there are uh, it's a last resort if you're attacked you have to defend yourself uh, no civilian casualties there's certain rules uh, that you would want to adhere to if that did occur but uh, the success is avoiding war that's that that's when you have success Absolutely. and, and uh, with our military might I think we have the chance to take to Take risks. We're, we're so strong militarily. We can take risks. Give this little country, a, well, whoever they might be, Venezuela, give them a chance. We're not, we're not going to saber rattle and be belligerent and dictate. And, uh, and let's welcome Maduro, who's leading the country, and try and uh, work with some of these people that we might not agree with 100%. So in, in between those two might be some, some, some other actions. The one that comes to mind is sanctions. What do you think of sanctions? Uh, I, I used to think they were better than conflict, but now they've become so that the people hate us so much because of the sanctions that I think they're counterproductive. I, I would step back from the sanctions and, and, and have a clean slate. And I do believe that most people, what they want is they want a job, they want a roof over their head, they want a doctor when they break their leg, they want yep. school, decent schools. They don't want to be going to war and fighting with everybody. I just have that deep belief in the people. I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, in, in, in terms of taking us from a, a peace footing here in America and, and moving us into a war footing is, is something the framers, and, and I'll contend pretty much, I, I think most Americans today believe is a very serious issue. The framers, um, in, in reading them, uh, talked about leaving that to the Congress. Um, your, your thoughts on you know, declaring war before sanctions, before uh, a strike, AUMF, where do, where do you come down in the constitutionality of the AUMF in terms of the War Powers Act? Uh, could, you, could you elaborate on that for me a little bit? Yes, the authors of the Constitution were very clear. It's Congress that declares war. They did give the president in the Constitution commander-in-chief language. So some would argue those who are in conflict and the president, because his commander-in-chief can do every, anything he wants, but I don't believe that. I believe in the the first article that mm-hmm. says it's Congress that declares war. And you talked about the uh, AUMF. I have a copy here, and I know this is radio, but this is... Oh, yeah, we're, we're actually... We have, okay. We'll have video as well. Okay. Uh, this is what we went into two days after September 11th. This is the, the actual paper that I carried in to vote on uh, responding to Afghanistan. It says draft, 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 draft at the top, and a bunch of whereases. And one of the whereases, whereas on September 11, 2001, acts of treacherous violence were committed against the United States and citizens. Treacherous is crossed off, rightfully so, because it wasn't treacherous. Treacherous comes from within. Mm-hmm. Handwritten above it is despicable. We walked in to give the president authorization to respond to September 11. This is the AUMF. This is the piece of paper, a sloppy paper with draft at the top that we're still using in Yemen, North Africa. I know the Iraq war was different. Mm-hmm. That was for Iraq, but this is, yeah. the, this is the general AUMF. That's how 
that's how broken the system is. Uh, yeah, and, and, it's a, I agree with you. And, and I, I, if it's crossed off words. Yeah, it, and draft at the top. I didn't get a chance to talk about it in the debate earlier, but maybe, maybe you know, that, I, I did have it in my that's pocket. That's a great prop. Well, and, and, and maybe I can maybe I can present something to you that maybe uh, people haven't talked about either. As per the Article Five Amendment process, um, the obviously the parties of the contract being the states, the contract being the Constitution, and the product being the United States government. The powers that were vested and delegated specifically to certain branches cannot be allocated by a simple policy or piece of legislation to another branch. It takes an Article 5 to change the Constitution. That never happened. Um, would, you, would you agree that whether it's the War Powers Act or the AUMF, it is an unconstitutional policy that doesn't withstand uh, constitutional authority in terms of being uh, in conflict with not only Article 5, but Article 6, Section 2, which is all laws must be pursuant to the Constitution or else they're not withstanding. Well, that, that's exa- what you're talking about is exactly what we need, is a change. And everything that you're talking about, I believe, was when Bush and Cheney came in and they argued for the executive polar yeah. uh, through the Constitution and John Yu and all these lawyers. And yeah. what happened to our country when that happened, when these, in my view, neo Con cuckoo clocks came in and, and took our country I, a, yeah. away from us, the people. We need now, twenty years later, from that crazy crowd that got that got us into these deficits and wars and gave the present unprecedented and unconstitutional power, in my view, the uh, time for a change. Yeah, and that's why I'm active and involved. Okay. And, uh, Thanks. Uh, any more questions? We. I'll, I'll do a sign out question. That just on a personal side, um, I do like your your focus on on the people when we're talking about sanctions and and so forth. And and I do think it's good to humanize people. What is something that you're very into that doesn't have to do with politics? Some, some something you like it can be a hobby, your grandchildren, whatever. I'm a horse person. Uh, after college, I worked on the horse racetrack. I learned how to shoe horses and then worked on a racetrack. And uh, which track? In Edmonton and Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Oh, right on. Stampede Park and Northlands Park. Okay. Stampede Park in Calgary, Northlands Park in uh, Edmonton. And there were harness horses, uh, trotters and pacers, yeah. pulling the sulky. And uh, I was good enough at it that I got a horse that set the track record. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, overburdened. So he had my shoes on. So <laughs> Very a, cool. Uh, I still stay involved in horses and follow horse racing. It's, uh, it's something special that I had in my life. Very cool. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm really honored that you had time to sit down with us. Uh, thank you for doing this. This has been The Rebellion. Uh, Lincoln, uh, I hope you have a good time here in Georgia, and uh, safe trails to you. Thank you. Good constitutional questions. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Let's stand up for that document. Something's nice happened well. in this country. And it's <laughs> slipping away from us. Yeah, we, uh, that's what we aim to do here. Bring Snowden home. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the Rebellion. We have Joe Jorgensen here. Uh, we are still, obviously, by the background noise at the Libertarian Party convention here in Georgia. These guys just got off the debate stage. Mm-hmm. Great performance. Really well done. Um, yes. I had, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm new to your campaign. Uh, it's the first time I'd heard you speak. Uh, I, I think you did some really nice stuff up there. It, I'm coming over as an old neocon. Uh, okay. And, and I said, this is, this is way back. But, you know, to, to see the different atmosphere at this convention and the, the way you guys interact with each other, I think it is such a breath of fresh air. So um, how long have you been? You, I mean, you said you were involved at, in college. Well, I heard about the Libertarian Party in college. Okay. So, yes, I went to my first uh, Libertarian meeting in 1979 okay. and voted for Ed Clark and everybody after that. She, and where was this? Is this up north? In the, uh, I was living in Dallas at the time. Okay. I got my MBA at SMU. And that's so you've I been all over it. the place. I, a few different states, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, um, one, one of the things that I think is a, a common theme and what I really, really like talking about is foreign policy. Uh, okay. Being a being a Marine at one point, it was just one oh. of those things where... Well, you know, thank you for your service. Well, it, it, unfortunately, it was to the banks and the corporations and all that crap, and, and, and it just, you know, thank you, but... But still, it... Oh, it, no, it, 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 it takes its toll. Yes. It, it sure does. Um, in terms of foreign policy... Um, in this last uh, couple of weeks here, we've had some pretty close calls with some really large incidents. Can you kind of give me a quick understanding and synopsis of what your position is on the, on the strike and the response and everything else that, that went down in those couple of weeks? The strike. On Soleimani. 
Oh, I, I see. When you said strike, I was thinking strikers, and oh, I was thinking yeah. Hong Kong or something. Um, yeah, so overall, I would bring the troops home. Okay. Because when we meddle in other countries, uh, it just causes problems. And a lot of Americans don't stop to think about it. What would you think if France came over here and started... Oh, you're pointing I'm, I'm, at him. I'm, I'm French. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let me let me pick Italy. No, 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 no. Please keep going. No, I just think it's, the, uh, I the think French it's would totally do that. I, yeah. I, I the, could see it happening. Yes, and Americans would be appalled. But the thing is, when you're doing it, you don't realize it. When it's done to you, then you do realize yeah. it. So I would like to make the point that, you know, when we go and involve ourselves in other countries, they don't like it. And it usually makes things worse. Every time we've taken out a dictator, somebody else comes in who's even worse. Yep. You know, go, go back to the Ayatollah. Go, you know, go back 30, 40, 50 years. So you're, you're referencing Operation Ajax. Operation Ajax. I didn't know what the name of it was. Uh, I just 1953, know the out- right? I just know the outcome. Um, yeah, well, and, and it culminated still in the 70s. I mean, it, it, and, and that's the problem. We go over there and we say, if we just kill this one guy, okay, problem solved. But it goes on for 10, 20, 30 years. And yeah. even uh, th- there was maybe some justification for going into Afghanistan. But it's like, okay, we're going to take down. And, and, you know, of course, yes, the, the, the hijackers were all from Saudi Arabia, at least 15 out of 16 of them. So, uh, But I understand um, that's where bin Laden was. But the whole idea was, um, and, and I believe even Ron Paul said, yes, let's go do this. But we'll go over there, just make it quick, and that's it. And then 10, 20, 30 years later, we're still there. Yeah, you imagine we might have learned something from Japan and Germany uh, back in the day. And when we go places, we don't leave real quick. No. And if you don't mind, I'd like to tell my story that I told in there about my Fiat Spider. So in, sure. the, in the early 80s, I, yeah. in the early 80s, I was driving a Fiat Spider. Um, as I say about convertibles, the wind in your hair, the rain in your lap, and that's with the top up. <laughs> so I was in <laughs> the parking lot. <laughs> yes. So I was in the parking lot of the grocery store, and this nice man comes over, you know, an older gentleman, and he said that he was a veteran from World War II. And he looked at me and looked at my car and just had the, uh, almost growled at me. And he said, how can you possibly drive a car from Italy after, you know, World War II? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't want to disrespect him, but my thinking was, well, if we're buying their cars, they're not, they're not going to bomb us, you know? Uh, if we buy Hondas and Toyotas, Japan's not going to bomb us. So wherever goods cross borders, troops don't. Hmm. And that's what we need to do. A little bossy out there. Oh, of course. Definitely <laughs> appreciate that. So uh, to make it easier to understand uh, your foreign policy maybe that's it, it's not that hard but let's say the situation is better right we're we're not in so many entangling wars right now right. Um, do you think there is ever a, justifi- a justification for war and uh, what would that look like the right way well thank you for my opening here that I can say that my uh, suggestion is that we become one giant Switzerland armed and neutral so of course we need to defend ourselves however we are we, we are not attacked that often. All, all the wars, almost all the wars we've been in have been other people's wars. So, of course, we defend ourselves. But that doesn't mean we go over and involve ourselves in other countries. And the one question I get is, well, do we leave troops over there in Germany or France uh, just to protect us? Because some people have the argument that, well, we need to be over there to keep them from coming over here. And I can say that the default answer should always be no. Now, maybe there, no, in other words, no, we shouldn't be there. Uh, First of all, there's no reason why these people shouldn't be paying for their own military defense. There's no reason that American taxpayers who are having problems paying for health care and food and mortgage, that we should be paying for Germany's defense. But on top of that, I, I don't know enough to say definitely, but the default answer is no, we should come home, that there's probably not a good reason to be there. I love it. I ab- absolutely love it. Let's say there's a, a random country. Um, of course, Iran is kind of the one that's being used right now, but any right. random country who wants to build a nuclear bomb and let's, and we just have mm-hmm. public information that, that they are, mm-hmm. um, should there be any action on our part? If so, what? If not, 
I guess there'd just be nothing. Yeah, no, in fact, we actually give people a reason to build a nuclear bomb. And if I recall, uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, basically, you know, agreed that, okay, I won't build a nuclear bomb, and then we go over and take them out. So basically what we've done is we've taught the other countries, uh, if you want to be safe from us, you better build a nuclear bomb. So... If, yeah, if we don't we, mess with those countries. <laughs> yeah. Pakistan, the Indias, I mean, we, right. we don't mess with those guys. Right. So I guess this, this could show people how effective you are being a politician. Let's say that the usual response, which, which I've heard many times, is, oh, you're, you're siding with terrorists. So they, they've said that about Tulsi Gabbard talking to Assad, and, and, and they, would, they might say, hey, you're, you're saying that, that, that Gaddafi is a great guy. What, what would be your, your response back to that sort of attack? I'm, what I'm saying is I'm siding with Americans. I'm not, I'm being neutral overseas. Again, armed, but neutral. So I'm not going to involve myself in other countries. Uh, it, it, think of it this way. If you go into a dangerous neighborhood and there's two gangs fighting each other, mm -hmm. you don't say, oh, okay, which is the better of the two gangs? You know, yeah. which two murderous gangs does the least damage? And I'm going to involve myself and I'm going to go fight for that gang. We wouldn't do that. So you know, if, if, if I walk through a dangerous city and there's gangs, I'm not going to say, yes, I'm going to choose this gang over that gang. We I, need to stay out of it. That's an awesome metaphor. Yeah, I don't, it really I, is. I think that's oh, I like think Scott's, you. like Scott Horton level metaphor. <laughs> oh, well, it's, thank it, you. <laughs> it's simpler than what Scott Horton would say, but that way well, I get it. Better, it's actually, so. it, yeah, it actually presents even better. I mean, the, the more simple you can make it for people to understand yeah. and, and boil it down, you know, it's 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 not just because of scale mm -hmm. or adulthood or anything else that makes force a, a good thing. So right, and that's why I appreciate the opportunity because that's been the problem that the Libertarian Party has had for. Decades decades, which is people don't listen, you know, that we're not given the opportunity to really explain it. And I mentioned Ed Clark, our 1980 presidential candidate, and people would ask him, well, you don't have a chance of being president, do you? Like, why are you doing this? And I thought he had a great answer. He said, you know, if I could go to every American's house and just sit around the kitchen table with them and explain libertarianism to them, explain freedom. I think they would get it, and I would definitely be uh, elected by an overwhelming majority. But the problem is, is that people don't get to hear this. Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks to thanks to new technology, even yes. <laughs> even a crayon eater like myself can, can a put what? something together. A crayon, a, a crayon eater. eater. Oh, <laughs> that's a, a self. To privacy. Anyway, okay. um, <laughs> at, at any rate, I think you're probably pretty good on the war on drugs, uh, from what I heard in there. Uh, tell tell me about prohibition in general. What what powers do were delegated through the Constitution to the federal government for prohibition? Well, I could go over that, but we were talking about explaining our position. If you don't mind, I would rather put it in terms that the average. I I love the Constitution. Uh, you know, people who love liberty love the Constitution. But if you tell people, well, I'm for liberty, freedom, they usually roll their eyes and say, well, we're the freest country already. So yeah. I like to come up with practical responses. Okay. And the practical response is, when's the last time you saw, you know, Walgreens and CVS having a shootout because, uh, you know, they were selling alcohol sure. and one was selling alcohol in the other's corner? Mm -hmm. Or when's the last time you saw a liquor store owner on the playground of either a grade school or, you know, in high school selling alcohol? If you take the profit it's out then you take a lot uh, a lot of the problems away so it's just not advantageous for a liquor store owner to go to a high school and try to sell his liquor there so if we had drugs with the same laws mm -hmm. it would take a lot of the profit out how is the CIA going to conduct their business without black money though I I guess with a little difficulty <laughs> <laughs> obviously a rhetorical question yes. <laughs> so um, you you express your appreciation for the Constitution. Yes. Um, what about the Constitution do you think is is not the greatest or imperfect, if anything at all? Um, I guess the fact that somehow the framers gave somehow the impression was given that it could be a quote unquote living Constitution, okay. but the framers predicted when they wrote it. You know, 
didn't they say something like, hey, if this lasts 200 years, this would be great? Oh, I mean, you the know, anti-federalists even, was like, you, you guys right. are doomed. So, right. I mean. I think they said that. And even, I, I think Jefferson said that it has to be updated at least every 20 years because we're going to mess it up or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. But but the problem with, with updating it every 20 years is now we're starting to take away the basic yeah. rights that should never be taken well, it's, away. Well, it's what it, it was what everything depended on in the first place, right? Without the Bill of Rights, the Constitution right. was never going to be. Uh, right. So, that, yeah, fair point. Yes, and also, I'm a big Second Amendment supporter, and I do understand the argument that, no, the Second Amendment was meant for militia only. Now, I don't get into that argument. Was it meant for the militia, or was it meant for everybody? Because I don't care. I think we should have the right. But it would have been nicer had they been a little more specific. I think it was just their, their pros at the time. Uh, yeah, and their, sta- their standalone, uh, you know, sentence fragment in the very beginning is just a predication. Uh, the you know the, the right to bear arms will not be infringed, obviously. With all that pretty handwriting, you oh, know, it's they- gorgeous, wasn't it? <laughs> right. Um, so you're good on those. I would like to ask a question I haven't asked of anybody today. Okay. Where do you stand on federal death penalty? Uh, I would stand with the Libertarian Party. Uh, it, it's been, and by the way, the uh, Libertarian Party is against the death penalty. Yeah. And to be honest, this is a, an issue that I was really never for or against one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And when I ran in 1996, people would ask me that question, and I would say, well, whatever the voters want. You know, basically, this is one that I wouldn't give my opinion. I'd say, let's all take a vote. Whatever you vote's fine with me. Okay. But after Illinois had to release all of those prisoners, after the DNA uh, yeah. showed that... So, so now I see that, no, there, there is a big problem. And by the way, my background is psychology. Okay. I teach psychology at Clemson University. And people never thought that anybody would give a false confession. Like, <laughs> that makes no sense at all. But they Silly don't, people. Right. But they don't understand human nature. Uh, people don't make a lot of sense a lot of times. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we've got. It is the human brain. It's right. a hard thing to understand. Right. In fact, um, that's what I love to... I, I use the example when I teach psychology that humans are not robots. If yeah. we were robots, what we would do make, would make a lot of sense. But because what we do doesn't make sense, now it makes it really interesting. It sure does. So mm-hmm. that, that change happened a while ago. Um, I'd love to understand more of the of the evolution because you ran, you, you were the VP in 1996 yes. of Harry Brown, is that correct? Yes. And um, so that means you've been a libertarian for a very long time, more, more, more than the average person. What is the last thing you changed your mind on ideologically? Uh, of any consequence, I, I would say I would say the death penalty. That was because, my last one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and but it wasn't the Libertarian Party that convinced me. It was Illinois. Okay. Which, by the way, is where I'm from originally. Okay. I grew up north of Chicago in a very small town with one red light. <laughs> Closer to to, to uh, the uh, the Wisconsin border, I exactly. Yeah. Very close to Wisconsin. So uh, kind of out in the middle of the cornfields. I definitely understand well, that. I, um, sh- I should have seen it could be a repeat question, so I'll just do my last. One as more of a personal thing. Okay. Um, as a psychology um, professor, you said, right? Well, technically senior lecturer, but nobody knows the difference. So, okay. I, 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 so that's why I say I teach psychology. I don't give myself a job title because nah. <laughs> then I have to explain it. So, um, what does that? How how has that allowed you to see how politics works in in what you would characterize as a unique way? Like some some insight you've gotten from from psychology that makes you look at politics and be like, oh, this this this, this makes sense because of this other innate hu- human nature. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, without throwing around too many, you know, two dollar or fifty cent whatever words, uh, cognitive dissonance. Yeah. That once. Oh, okay, so good. Yeah, so, we're, we're yeah. very aware of cognitive. Okay, yeah. awesome. So once people make a commitment towards something, well, what it boils down to is people don't like being hypocrites. People don't like to be caught saying one thing and doing another. So they just ignore and, it. And so, well, what will happen is they may support a candidate. And, and, and by the way, if you go back to Barack Obama or even looking at Bernie Sanders, mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, if you look at their campaigns, mm-hmm. they said nothing is too small. Even $5 will help. But I'm sure what was going on is if you send in your $5, now you're less likely to vote for other people. So I'm not even sure that it was the money they wanted. It's the fact that, oh, geez, now this person's going to feel real pain if, it, you know, they don't want to say, oh, I gave my money to that one candidate, but now I got to, you know, now I want to choose another one. So it's it's a way of commitment. So That's a really good point. So, so what will happen is people 
will become committed to one and they just really don't want to be hypocrites and so they might not want to change their minds and really that would be an effect for the Libertarian Party especially if you've never heard of the Libertarian Party now you're a Democrat or Republican at some point you've got to you feel that little psychological pain of cognitive dissonance saying oh geez I was wrong I was supporting the wrong party and I've got to come to this one so one thing that my campaign is doing is we're trying to reach out to younger people And one last comment, if you don't mind. When I ran for VP, whenever I'd go to different cities, I would always ask them, hey, is there a high school I could talk to in the afternoon before I speak at whatever event? Mm -hmm. Just to reach young people, just hear what they're talking about, and just to have them hear what a libertarian is. Because I wish I had heard of libertarians in high school. long ago, yeah, absolutely. So college, I I was thrilled that I learned about them in college, but it would have been a heck of a lot better in high school. Totally agree with you. Uh, So the moral of the story is, don't donate to political candidates, right? No. <laughs> Unless you're sure. <laughs> right. um, I, I want to give you a second here uh, at the end uh, to, to plug in and, and, and tell everybody where they can find you and how to, to help you out. Oh, thanks so much. It's joj2020.com. So, yeah, my first name and my last initial. So, joj2020.com. Social media? Uh, Joe, the number four, Liberty on Twitter. Okay. Joe for Liberty. And then there is a Facebook. Okay. And I think you can find me on Facebook. <laughs> Easy. I, I don't have the exact um, exact thing, but. Well, we. I, I want to say thank you very much for sitting down, making a oh, little time for thanks us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, my and, pleasure. And again, this was my first time uh, in this campaign talking with a couple guys. So um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. It's our pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Banks, anything else? That's it. Thank you so much. All right, okay. Joe, take care. Safe travels out there. We go. Hey, we're back. Banks is on a panel right now. I have another presidential candidate here for the Libertarian Party, Eric Gerhardt. Welcome to uh, the Rebellion. Well, thank you for having me. Is this your favorite? Uh, is this your favorite podcast? I don't have a favorite <laughs> podcast. I'm kind of new to the whole podcast thing. I yeah. Mean, I mean, even just this whole political. I'm gonna, sense. You can pull that to you, man. You're not going to hurt anything. Just, you know, kind of channel your Joe Rogan here and get real close. And, and relax, man. You're you're among friends. So ha, tell, where are you from? I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, oh, yeah? Where, whereabouts? About uh, 20 minutes north of Philadelphia. Okay. A little town, Pennsburg. It's like a couple streets wide. It's nothing real big. Yeah, no, I actually spend a pretty good deal of time uh, up in, in kind of that area of Jersey and all that fun stuff, man. So, yeah, no, to- I totally get it. Um, the, the the calling for to, to run for president is this is this your first run in any office or have you run in, in the past? What have you been? No, this is my first run at anything. You're just saying, screw it, I'm going for LP president, huh? I'm going for president in general because either you can go big or go home. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty much going as big as I can. And yeah. What's your, what's your history, man? What do you, what do you what have you been into in the past? I, I've been doing carpentry for like the last 17 years. Blue collar, man. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. Working hard. Uh, Back in the uh, Boy Scouts, like years and years ago, all the way from Cub Scout through all the ranks, all the way up to Boy Scout, all the way to the top, and s- s- senior patrol leader and everything. I uh, had a little den of uh, Cub Scouts that I did a den chiefing for. Mm-hmm. And uh, back when I was in the Scouts is when I first had the idea, talking to all the World War II veterans about their experiences and about leadership and stuff like that. and. I decided that this was my Eagle project. This is what I wanted to do for my Eagle project. But I never got Eagle because I couldn't achieve this yeah. until now. So there's no point in getting it. So I stopped at star rank, you know, shooting stars, break the mold, all part of my plan. Sure. Well, it's good, man. No, I mean, and, and I mean, to, 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 to walk out and, and, and say that, man, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, I've, I've run for Congress in the past and I can tell you, you know, like if you're traveling around, I mean, you're coming down from Pennsylvania, probably mm-hmm. into Georgia, you're going to be making all the rounds and I'm going to do as many as I can. I mean, blue collar, I can only do a certain amount of events. I don't have like a huge following cause I'm completely unknown, but you got to start somewhere Yeah, and as long as I got the right message and it, it vibes with a lot of people, hopefully it'll pick up pace and I can continue on. You, and you, even if I fail with this run right now, as long as I get some recognition when yeah. I come back in four years, because I'm coming back. Yeah. Then we can. You're really gonna parlay get this. So you, so you, so you got some realistic expectations. That's. I mean, it, it's good. Realistic, I mean, but I have no like high point, low point. I'm. I'm going 
however it rolls is how it rolls. That's right on. So uh, tell me, tell me where you stand on some issues, man. Foreign policy, where you at? Foreign policy. I mean, we should have been out of there a long time ago. Middle they've East. Been, they've been fighting for thousands of years. I mean, and they need to put their own government in place. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had a, a type of government that they had running for their way for thousands of years. It was brutal, crazy, and it didn't benefit their people. But with the freedom of information, mm-hmm. people are starting to get that they have the rights to have liberties and freedoms and just say what they want to say. So your commander-in-chief should say, hey, bring them, out, bring them all home. I would say bring them home, and then there needs to be direct contact between commander-in-chief, if myself, yeah. I would be directly involved with talking to the, the leaders of their countries because it needs to be top to top. It can't be top and then delegated because okay. they won't respect that. I mean, you got to give them the respect and show them that you're committed to actually helping everyone. Okay. Where are you at on, um, where are you at on drugs? Drugs? I mean, I know the Libertarian Party would like to have everything legalized. Yeah. I personally stand with... If it's a medical benefit to the people, mm-hmm. it should be decriminalized. It should also be deregulated from a narcotic to a medical herb. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't infringe on anybody's Second Amendment rights because they're trying to take people's guns away with saying you need this medical card, you lose your guns. Like that you shouldn't, they shouldn't be quit for quo for sure. you, you, you get something, you lose something. It's either you get it or you don't. Okay. And I, I, truthfully, I mean, with the amount of research they've done, it's it's a it is a medicine. You're talking about cannabis, yeah, oh, yeah, very definitely. specifically. Oh, yeah, what, what, what about what about uh, self determination and all other drugs? What do you think about that? I mean, people are going to do what they want to do anyway. You're saying, the drug, you're saying the drug war didn't work? Hey, were you kidding me? Has it? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, man. Like, I, trust me. I, I know you're not familiar with the program, but I'm telling you right now that yeah, I you know, drugs won the the war on drugs, man. So. Uh, it's just a waste of money. I mean, yeah. they've, they've put in all these different organizations just to squander it away. And it, I mean, they even the government was in on selling drugs at one point. Oh, man, they're, st- they're still in on it. Oh, yeah, you exactly. Know, they, they, it's like, and then they're going to tell us we can't do it if they're doing it yeah. to make it a profit. I mean, well, when, is, you, when you're running, you know, black operations, right, you need black money. And so what do you do? You got to make you got to make some black money somehow. So what do you, you got to you've got to take prohibition and you got to put it into effect and make a black market so that you can make black money off of it. So you can run your black ops. It, it, it makes perfect sense. It only makes sense. But, you know, the amount of people that need that medicine cannabis specifically cannabis yeah. sp- specifically for sure yeah and then i mean there's even studies into mushrooms yeah. being able Psilocybin to help people and, with the uh, abs- dementia absolutely and i mean like i said if it has a medical benefit there's no reason that people shouldn't get medicine and the natural medicines mm-hmm. not the synthetic medicines that the drug corporations like we really need to like get into the fda and change the laws about how they regulate these things so that it's open up to natural growth right? because you can't reproduce that. You can make it quicker, but you can't actually recreate the time it takes for that plant to grow, all the processes that it goes through to actually make it really refined. That was Catherine Bernard, folks. Yep. She just walked right in front of the She's camera. Allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just having fun. Catherine's going to be on the show later. Uh, gave a tremendous speech this morning. And uh, <laughs> I think you're going to have to come a little bit closer. You can say hello to everybody if you want to speak into that. Just say hi. And, and I'm looking forward to talking to y'all. <laughs> I love this kind of format. People just pop in and say hello. Yeah. Be safe out there. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's all right. But, um, Getting back to, uh, so, all right, you, you checked two of my boxes. Foreign policy, uh, drug wars, complete failure. What else is part of your platform? What do you, what do you want uh, people to know about you? Well, I mean, an education basis. So, I mean, the public schools, they're, they're just, they're broken. And I, I was listening to you earlier, yeah. but this is part of my whole thing is we need to fix the education system. But the, the, how we can actually bring it to make it more efficient so mm-hmm. that it can run properly is what needs to be done. The simple fixes within itself, not actually rechange and retooling. What a, what would you say to somebody like me, man? And, and, and I'm a hard case on this. And, and I'm, I'm you know, I, I apologize in advance for kind of, you know, 
I feel like I've got some expertise on this. Have you ever read any of the uh, like John Taylor Gatto or Connor Boyack or any of those? I highly recommend both those guys. It, it, uh, Gatto actually opened up my eyes to um, what government indoctrination is, right? And and I I've, I've always seen it since then as you have liberty mm-hmm. and you have government. And government and liberty don't coexist well, and they're always at opposition. So mm-hmm. if you give education to the government, what are they going to do? They're going to teach against liberty. Yeah. And so we've already kind of seen that. I mean, it plays sure. allegiance. It's gone. And then now they're pitching the dem. It's we're fighting for this democracy. I was like, I thought it was as a republic in the Pledge of Allegiance. Constitutional Republic. Yeah. A- absolutely. And it's 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 sad. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big reasons why I'm I'm doing this because would you be all for at least getting the shutting down the government uh education system in terms of at the federal level, the federal uh the federal education or, I don't know about shutting it down unless there's a viable option. Well, I mean, uh, the states used to own it, and I'll tell you, you know, just from history is throughout history is people uh, most of the time just either self-taught or community taught, and it was voluntary, right? Like if you didn't want your kid going to that school over there that was voluntary anyway, you didn't have to, and you definitely didn't pay those people money mm-hmm. uh, it, it's because you know you could take that same money and put it towards your kid's education at home or whatever you were doing. I don't think anybody has a problem with paying like the school taxes. I mean, that's one tax that there's actually. I do. I have a huge problem. They take they, they they take thousands of dollars from me every year and they throw it into the tax system. I homeschool. I could take that money. I mean, as long as it went to the proper channels. I mean, that's the way it. Th- there's so many things sure. that are so broken in in all of the government laws that they have written. It's all loopholes, and they squander the money and yeah. stupid things. I mean, even just the whole impeachment proceedings that they're going through. This is a waste of time, mm-hmm. and taxpayers money their benefits that they've been paying for for their whole lives taking it out of social security and it, it's it's a, it's a disgrace it's just a disgrace i mean there, there's not one politician in the, out there right now that i can say is actually fighting for it hardcore to actually get these you, changes do you know done. thomas massey no no, I don't know many politicians like. So Thomas Massey, uh, he's, he's a. You should look him up, man. He's he's one of the the good guys on the national side. Um, he's he's much. He's, he's even better than Rand Paul. Uh, but he's he's out there and and he he's a representative of, of Northern Kentucky. Okay, absolutely fantastic guy. I think you'd really enjoy him. Um, what else we got? Uh, in, in terms of we talked about education, we talked about defense, we talked about um about drugs. Um, any big other major issues you think the United States is facing right now? Debt, taxation, IRS, I Federal mean, Reserve. The debt is it's it's out of control. Yeah, and they're they're not slowing down whatsoever. And truthfully, as a standard, every president should have a plan to make a way to lower that down and actually make money. If you're coming in, you're going to say, "I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to spend money, do this, that, and the other thing." It's it's a waste of time because if you don't have a plan to actually get that debt down, it's like who comes collecting down the line and then who pays for that? That's the people. Yeah. And from what I've seen with the uh, the Democratic plans of how they want to tax everybody, and they up the tax to what forty two percent, and you have sales tax that's fifty percent. Doesn't matter if you raised the actual minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour because that fifty percent now you're at seven fifty. And the minimum wage was eight seventy. So now they're taking the dollar twenty off the top, even if you get that fifteen dollars. And it's just, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's how, insane, how, it, they, it, how, I, they've it's sold insanity. it yeah. horribly, well and well because nobody's seen it yet. But that's the reason why I'm here because like I want to say these things because I see all this and it's driving me absolutely insane. Yeah. Well, hey man, I, I commend you. You know, a, a lot of people uh, would. Uh, will never ever run for office. Uh, they'll 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 complain and they'll never ever do anything to to try to to run and and, and be a part of it. And so I I understand firsthand uh, the the trials and tribulations and the, the 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 sometimes the nerves and the the anxiety and just the overall work that it takes. So uh, hats off to you, man, for for stepping out big time. How can how can people help you, man? Where can they find you in social media I'm and all that on, other stuff? Uh, Facebook at Eric Gerhart 2020. I also have uh, Eric Gerhart 2020.com. Yeah. I have uh, the store up and 
donations and all that. I'm going to be posting YouTube videos of my ideas just solely by myself. I mean, that's how I like to do it. I'm, yeah. I'm more of a homebody. I like my solace. I am have horrible social anxiety. <laughs> I'm facing these fears because this is so gets, important to me. It gets me. easier, man. Trust oh, me. I know it gets easier, but every day, I mean, my last debate, I almost, my heart almost jumped out of my chest, hey, but you know, that's courage, right brother. here, right here. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm calm. I'm a little bit frustrated, but it, just because I don't see nothing getting done yeah. and, and I, it, you got to take it to the top. Like you can't, you got to shoot, shout it from the mountaintop and this is the mountaintop. And as long as enough people hear it, things will actually start to get to change. Well, right on, man. Well, Eric, thank you for, uh, for doing this. And, uh, I, I wish you the best of luck out there and I'm sure we'll be, uh, talking again, maybe hopefully even next year doing the same thing. Well, yeah. I mean, if I can, I can get out there and you guys send me an invite, I'll definitely come. All right, brother. Eric, nice to meet you, man. Yep. It was T good to meet you take as care. well. Well, ladies and gents, that wraps up all of the LP Georgia convention interviews. I hope you have really enjoyed them. I know uh, that I absolutely was thrilled to death to get to talk to so many people in such a short time and really uh, have those conversations that maybe you wanted to have and ask some questions that uh, were, were on the tip of your brain or maybe spark some new ones. But uh, at any rate, that's going to do it for us on The Rebellion today. You can uh, go out there and send us anything you'd like to bring to our attention at info at rebellionpod.com. If you found value in the show and you'd like to support the podcast, you can go out to patreon.com slash rebellionpod. We'd be honored uh, to have you in our in our patrons. You know, it's uh, what helps us keep the lights on and and grow this thing larger and larger, taking over the culture here uh, in, in the South and, you know, throughout the country. But uh, as always, we also ask you guys to take a few seconds, go out there, give us a five-star review. We'll read it here on the air. And uh, we just, we're, we're thrilled to death to continue to do this for you guys and to uh, continue to grow the rebellion. Until next time, this is your place for peace, liberty, and free markets. We love you. We need you. Peace. Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff.